Welcome to the National Women's Fitness Academy podcast. We're here to talk about women's health, female hormones, body image, and all things health and fitness. Hello, girls, and welcome back to another episode of the Women's Fitness Academy's podcast. I'm your host, Siggy, one of the WFA WFA's educators and a body confidence coach. Today, you're in for a treat because we are going to be talking about all health things that have to do within your environment. And what a better way to actually bring on a specialist who literally breathes this for her job. And I want to welcome Amy Skilton, who is a naturopathic health educator and a mold queen. Now, with today's conversation, Amy truly believes that wellness is the birthright of every woman. It is for us to have an abundance of energy, glowing skin, happy hormones, and a body that really feels good to live in. And what a better way to have this conversation, to have an understanding of whether your nutrition is supporting you, are your lifestyle um, supporting you, and what areas of your environments need a little bit even enhancing or changing and what a better way to get started to understand Amy's practice about how we need to start focusing more on this intersection around our hormone health and environmental factors. So Amy, I want to thank you for joining me. Thank you so much, Siggy. I'm so excited to be having a chat with you today and Oh, I'm so passionate about hormones, well, women's health in general, but hormones as well. And I think today is going to be an interesting conversation for your listeners because women's hormone health is, you know, receiving more airtime than ever. Thank God, because we've been absolutely in the dark ages forever as far as medicine and health goes or allopathically speaking. And I think a lot of women don't realize yet that our hormones are actually just a reflection of our well-being. They're a symptom and not like the actual root problem. And I imagine your listeners are very well informed about lots of lots to do with hormonal health, but I think what we're covering today is going to be kind of new for them. Definitely. And I want us to really like dive straight in to the fact of how, as you mentioned, how our hormone health is in fact intersection with our environmental and lifestyle factors. And what a better way to start this conversation around mold and the e, uh, EMF, EMF, S, oh my God, I can't pronounce it, the <laughs> electromagnetic fields. So for those who don't know, it's like your Wi-Fi, your internet, your phone use. And I want you to please make our listeners understand like what is your belief around, you know, mold and these electromagnetic fields and how they impact um, our hormones and over overall health? Mm. So literally everything we do, eat, think, breathe, say to ourselves, influences our cellular health and where that might show up depends on perhaps your own, I guess, genetic vulnerabilities or, you know, um, inherited historical weaknesses, if I can call them that. So that the name of the disease or the name of the issue, let's call it PMS, um, for example, could be different for every woman. But the same is true for our environment. Like our body is high, we're a biological dynamic um, being of, you know, bazillions of cells that make up tissues and organs and systems that are constantly in contact with our environment. And the feedback from our environment is actually dictating genetic expression as well as enzyme activity and influencing our health in a really significant way. And, you know, it's wonderful that people are so aware now that, you know, nutrition is so important, like the quality of the food that you have, your macronutrient breakdown in line with your goals. And, you know, I'm sure many of your listeners also take supplements, but I think all of those things, and I found this out the hard way, by the way, all of those things will get you so far, but they will not help you overcome an environmental factor because it's larger than that. It's bigger than that. It's more powerful than that. 
And my personal story with this began at the age of 36, 37, I was almost 37 when I moved into an apartment that had uh, a leak. And we were in that apartment for five, six months. Um, the leak wasn't obvious. There wasn't any visible mold, but I went from having been, you know, a healthy, thriving, vital woman for my entire adult life. I'd certainly had some issues as a teenager, like PCOS, endometriosis, acne, and that was my original niche, by the way. So I studied naturopathy, nutrition, herbal medicine, and beauty therapy, actually. So I, I do aesthetics and, and had a skincare line, actually. And skin was my jam and women's hormones and fertility. Um, and I, you know, as a one side qualified and sorted my own hormones out. I was just thriving. And then I moved into this property and my health just started to deteriorate little bit by little bit, step by step. And, you know, I already ate an organic diet. My macros were so dialed in. I had a great lifestyle. In fact, I'd even taken a year off work to work on some personal projects. So I didn't even have the stress of you know, deadlines or commitments um, that to take away from, you know, my well-being in any way. And yet, in spite of all of that and the high quality supplements I was taking, just literally every single thing in my body went wrong and went wrong in a really wild and bad way. What was tricky about that, though, was it wasn't like I was perfectly healthy one day and ill the next. So it wasn't like an infection or an injury where it was obvious how I was injured or how I was being impacted, it sort of crept up over a number of months. And yeah, ultimately I became so unwell um, physically and cognitively, I couldn't remember my own name. I had a form of dementia that's induced by poisons. And in this case, it was toxins made by mold and the inflammation that that creates. And, you know, it took me a good couple of years mainly to find a home that wasn't going to poison me um, and then to start to recover. But it was a real wake up call around just how significant environmental factors are. I also developed EMF sensitivity during that time because whenever we're injured or inflamed for any other reason, we become more sensitive to environmental toxins and poisons and inflammagens and, you know, chemicals and things like that. And so as actually really as a way to, to keep myself safe, I started studying building biology, starting with becoming a certified mold testing technician. Now, I never planned to actually specialize in this space because it's actually quite a horrible space <laughs> to operate in. It's not sexy. It's not fun. It's usually people are really unwell and really stressed. And there's a lot of constraints around, you know, finding a, a, a healthy home that makes it hard to recover. It's not a matter of taking a protocol, following a protocol. But anyway, I reluctantly have ended up, you know, focusing on this area because unfortunately it's not in the allopathic medical curriculum. So unless you see a GP who's been trained by ACNAM, which is the Australian College of Nutritional Environmental Medicine, or they're a naturopathic doctor, um, they have absolutely no clue. Um, about how mold can make you sick. They have no idea how to assess for it, diagnose it or treat it. And most um, people, men and women, who end up with this uh, gas, either gaslit by the doctor or they are subjected to a battery of tests and they just still come up empty handed. And unfortunately, environmental medicine is actually quite scant in the naturopathic curriculum as well, certainly in Australia, um, which means you could actually see a really good naturopath. And if they haven't been trained in this area specifically, they will also potentially miss the signs or they might clock that you're being made ill by mold, but they actually don't know how to advise you properly in terms of treatment, which actually step number one is, is sorting out the environment. So for me, I feel like I've got a foot in these two worlds. Um, you can obviously hire a building biologist to test your home for any number of environmental um, toxins or inflammatory triggers, including mold and EMF, but they also can't help you with the health side of things once they've sorted the, the home out. So I feel a sense of duty <laughs> to continue to educate in, in, in the space and talk about it and raise awareness. And also I, I just couldn't walk away from it because there just aren't enough practitioners at the moment who actually have got a handle on both sides of the coin there.
Mm -hmm. I love the fact that you shared your story around living in a household of mold because I've been there in the past and I know for a fact that for so many years I had no idea how badly it was affecting not only my mental health but also like you know, my hormones, everything that, that was going on. I thought I was literally going crazy till I, one day I was discovering that I had some mold in the bathroom, very similar situation to yourself where there was leakage in the bathroom, but it wasn't obvious. You couldn't tell it. Um, and I just remember also asking the landlord at the time to have a look at it. And they literally had to pull the whole bathroom out, rebuild it, restore it. Unfortunately, it didn't fix the issue. The mold mm -hmm. just became worse and worse. And, you know, as yourself as an expert, when you know around mold and after studying the biology side of things of mold, we know if we if you don't get rid of it properly, it just mm -hmm. comes back and it grows back. Mm -hmm. And and it's too, it's not funny. It's quite sad to see how certain people think they can just live with the mold. They're like, oh yeah, you know, it's just part of the household is just like, no, that's like a red flag that like you're literally sitting and breathing mm. toxins, poison into, into your body. And this is why I wanted to bring you on to have this conversation to make people more aware about the fact that mold is a big issue to our health. Big time. So I guess what, when we think about mold, like most people would probably be, like you mentioned, of the assumption that it's just a bit of a visible blight, like it's just ugly, but it, but what it actually represents is a it's a proxy for water damage, and mold mold's actually microscopic, so most of the time you can't see it. By the time you actually can see it, there's actually a significant issue, um, but often it is actually trapped inside wall cavities and subfloors and ceiling cavities, so you could have quite a significant mold problem and actually not even see it. Um, by the way, I might just quickly mention there are other signs of mold in a home. So if you're curious, I do have a free webinar and the link will be in the show notes if you want to learn some of those other signs of like whether you've got water damage in the home. Um, but certainly uh, what it actually represents is water or an elevated moisture level in the home. That actually changes the microbiome of the home. So just like if you start eating more refined carbs or sugar, you change your microbiome for the worse and you start to get candida and other yeasts overgrowing or undesirable bacteria. When water is introduced into building materials that are biodegradable, mold is the biodegrader um, and recycler that shows up to, to do that. But actually it's a visible proxy for bacteria, spirit sheets, all kinds of disgusting microorganisms that can also produce toxins. So bacteria produce endotoxins, highly inflammatory. Um, mold toxins, of course, very poisonous and can damage organs and tissues and damage your gut microbiome. And there are kind of four main ways mold can make you sick. So number one, mold um, and, of course, all the bacteria that sort of also thrive in a water-damaged building or a damp building can cause, I guess, allergy, cold, flu type symptoms. So you've got airborne particulate, a bit like people who get hay fever from pollen. You've got mold spores and particulate in the air, which irritate the eyes, nose, throat, lungs. And so for me, my first symptoms were sneezing, blocked nose at night, itchy throat, watery eyes. Um, so, I, you know, if you're taking antihistamines all the time, that's a huge red flag as a practitioner that you've actually got an environmental issue that's affecting you. Dampness also um, if, uh, helps dust mites proliferate. Dust mites are a you know really common allergen as well. I actually had my first and only asthma attack of my life um, when I inhaled mold as well. Um, it's known that if you grow up in a moldy home, you are much more likely to be an asthmatic or develop asthma. Um, they haven't gone so far to say as mold causes asthma. Other, They say it triggers or exacerbates it. But I can tell you from my experience as a non-asthmatic, I had an asthma attack due to mold, even though I'm not an asthmatic. So I think there's going to be more information coming out there. So that would be in the category of 
allergic type reactions. Same with eczema. There's a huge correlation with eczema and mold. The moldier the home, the worse the eczema. So if you've got bad eczema or it's unresponsive to treatment, or you're having to work really hard to stay on top of it, again, that would suggest to me there's an environmental influence that's been overlooked. Um, then you've got the infection part. This is the least common one. And this is really the only um, one that allopathic practitioners like GPs would look at or even immunologists. Um, I actually had a professor at a hospital in Sydney try and tell a client of mine that mould um, couldn't cause respiratory inflammation. And it was like, well, here's 30 papers that say the opposite. It was terrifying that a respiratory professor it was so out of touch, first of all, with the scientific literature that is easily accessible to even the general public, um, but to also be so arrogant to not to not look. But anyway, infections really where they focus. So they're going to look for aspergillosis. So have you got um, fungi growing in your sinuses or even your your lungs? But that's kind of rare and more common in people who are immunocompromised or might be on steroids for things or have other things going on. You can definitely have both of these things and also all of the things I'm mentioning, but that's probably the least common. Um, then thirdly, we see chronic inflammation being triggered. Now, chronic inflammation um, can cause all kinds of problems in the body and the brain. So mood, hormones, gut, skin, muscles, like literally everything, energy, breathing, um, so inflammation, and then you've also got toxicity. So, you know, we can be poisoned by anything, um, you know, whether it's a synthetic chemical or a natural chemical, for example. And in the case of um, water damaged molds, there are a handful of species that produce mycotoxins or poisons. And these things can damage our kidneys, damage our liver, damage our brain. So that are kind of the four main ways. The fifth thing to be mindful of though is if you are one of like 25 so roughly 25 percent of the population have a vulnerable gene genotype and i'm one of them and it actually just causes such widespread inflammation and destruction in the body you can develop something called sirs or cirs and it stands for chronic inflammatory response syndrome and just all hell breaks loose really health wise um, and, and certainly that's what happened for me um, I will say if you want to learn more about the things that mold can do to us, I also have a free ebook you can download from the show notes. Um, some of the big ones I see is chronic gut issues and SIBO. I see fibromyalgia. I see chronic fatigue syndrome. I, obviously, hormone problems go without saying, and I'll, I might actually touch on that a little bit more deeply about how mold does that in a minute, um, but also weight issues. So it can be either end of the spectrum. It's more common. Weight gain is more common. It can basically the inflammation damages your hypothalamus and your brain and can cause leptin resistance. And that's what happened to me. I put on 20 kilos out of nowhere in the matter of like half a year. It was outrageous. Having been the same weight my whole life, like a couple of kilos either side, it was just incredibly alarming. Um, and of course, when you have that type of less leptin resistance, you just, you can't, nothing works to help you lose weight. Um, and you also feel very tired all the time and um, fatigued. And, you know, some people have upregulated appetite. I didn't because of my cortisol issues. But because of that, many people with leptin resistance think, oh, well, I'm just overweight because I'm hungry all the time and I can't control my appetite when it's actually, a, you know, a biomechanical thing. Um, but the same is also true for being underweight. I think it has to do with a number of things that the impact on the HPA axis or the stress it causes on the body, plus the damage to the gut lining. But also when you see someone lose weight really quickly and unexpectedly and find it really difficult to put weight on, that's another red flag um, to me, you know, when those other variables are present, that there's an issue uh, with mold. So it's definitely not something that can just cause a bit of hay fever and maybe a fungal infection in your sinuses. It's much more serious than that. And actually, in some ways, I'm quite grateful. I have a dodgy mold gene because what happens for me is when I'm exposed to mold, I get very sick very quick. Whereas someone who doesn't would happily live in a moldy water damaged home because they like, don't feel too affected or not affected enough that it impacts their life. And they're the ones that are going to be 20 years later, have a tumor on their kidneys. And they'll be like, where did that come from? 
like that, that doesn't run in my family or I've got some random tumors here or some random rare cancer. Well, when you're exposed to carcinogenic toxins over time, like in a place that you sleep and live in or work in, um, as the case may be, one someday your body is just going to have to be impacted by that. Mm. God, it's so interesting that we're talking about this because, again, going back to how you said, like some people will be so sensitive to it that it would dysregulate the nervous system and they'll notice symptoms straight away where there's also the other percentage of people who are not as affected by it, but eventually 10, 20 years later on, they will be affected by it. What are some signs that people can start looking out for within their home? Because as you mentioned previously, that there are stages of mold Mm, in the house. mm -hmm. And when it's already showing in your home, it's just like, okay, we know it's already like Mm. it's a red hazard it's not a orange hazard yes (laughs) and so we we want to know we want to notice and understand better like how can they manage the environment a little bit better when there is that sort of signs of mold but not as bad that they have to literally just like chop the whole house out and like yeah yeah burn it down yeah (laughs) walk away (laughs) So good question. So look, I think um, in the future, it will be a household understanding on how to manage moisture in the environment. Um, And I might touch on some of those things in our chat today, just, you know, to to help listeners, you know, for this episode to get started. But other, I guess, red flags that there's an issue in the home that don't include seeing a dirty patch of mold somewhere is uh, number one, any kind of odor in the home. So a dry, clean, healthy home should smell like nothing, nothing but fresh air. So if you have, if your home has a fragrance to it, <laughs> like it doesn't have to be classic musty mold smell. Mold can make all kinds of VOCs, which are gases that have their own fragrance. They can smell like anything from cheese to fermented mushrooms, to alcohol, to marijuana, to dirty socks, to vomit, to rotting leaves. Like, you know, it's it's a very colorful array of fragrances that mold can produce. So typically, though, it might smell a bit musty or a bit yeasty or a bit less than ideal. That's usually not a pleasant smell. So if you've got any rooms or cupboards or spaces in your home that when you walk into that space or especially if it's been shut up for a few days because you were away for the weekend or you've come back from holiday and you're like well it smells a bit musty in here that's a sign there is bacterial and fungal activity Um, and especially if you're having to put you know I mean I'm not a fan of endocrine disrupting fragrances but I know people will put in you know diffuser reeds or room sprays or you know scented candles to try and make a room smell better If you're having to try and cover up a smell in a room, that room is unhealthy. So that's definitely one red flag. Another red flag are things like water stains. So if you typically you'd see these on a ceiling, if there'd been a roof leak, if you can see like an outline of a watermark, that's a sign of a leak, either, you know, current or maybe old. But it's also where there's water, there's life. And if the water's been left to sit there for more than 12 hours, you've got bacteria growing. And from after more than like 24 to 48 hours, you've got mold. So, you know, a lot of people don't realize if they have a leak or a flood that you've got to get everything dry within 48 hours or it needs to be cut out. You can't just leave it to dry naturally and and then think, oh, it's fine. Um, bubbling paint, peeling paint, swelling skirting boards you know darker shadowy marks if you're looking at like the walls on the outsides of your bathroom or anything like that they're all kind of red flags um and one property that i was in uh the corner of the carpet had started to kind of break down and be eaten away where it met the bath the skirting board on the in the bathroom was on the other side um so it's another red flag so molds come to life because of the moisture Um, Often you can't feel that it's wet or damp unless it's absolutely saturated. So hence why, you know, people might touch the wall or touch the carpet and think, oh, it feels dry. You can't feel it. You don't have the the sensitivity. So getting a moisture meter is a great household tool so that you can check for any leaks or dampness from periodically, especially after a big storm or, or, you know, let's say your kids overflow the bath 
and you've now got to get the dehumidifier and the heaters in there. You can kind of check and make sure everything's dried out within 48 hours. And if not, that's when you call an expert. But certainly managing water intrusion like that is key. Um, managing moisture from, from when we create it inside. So when we cook, we're making steam that needs to be vented to the outside of the house. When we're showering, it's creating steam that needs to be vented to the outside of the house. If we're drying clothes inside the house, like in winter, which we often have to do because it's rainy or cold, um, where is that moisture going? If you're not actually actively managing it, it's being absorbed into your walls, ceilings, carpets, cushions, mattresses, couches, and making them moldy. If you're going to bed with wet hair, your pillow is moldy and you're literally breathing in all kinds of horrible microorganisms for eight hours or night, at, you know, give or take. Um, so managing moisture is what it comes down to because we're building properties out of mold food. And the only thing we can do to control that is keeping the humidity within 45 and 55% and making sure any other moisture is managed so it doesn't make things damp. Mm, such valuable lessons right here in regards to mold. Um, and looking back, my old household had cracks in the walls, the the painting was coming off, and I just, you know, naive, not understanding, going, oh, they just need a fresh paint. No, that is a sign yeah. of, of dampness, yeah. And it's a very common um, way of dampness in the bathrooms, especially some bathrooms don't have windows, so you have to keep the fan on, but too often people won't keep the fan on long enough mm. to actually make the bathroom dry. And, mm. again, that accepts the issue of mold makes it makes it worse so hopefully everyone who's tuning into this can start looking at their household or even the bathroom I feel as if the bathroom is like the first place where dampness starts also the other parts of home as you mentioned like good points around after a storm or you know issues with like the plumbing side of things but it's so interesting because it's not spoken openly or highly enough about and I feel as if when we do speak about it people tend to just brush it off they're like oh it's not a big deal it's not an issue it's not going to cause any any um, health issues but as you've mentioned there's mm -hmm. massive signs and red flags around that that is caused by by our environmental factors like the mold exposure and how it's going to affect our hormones our mental health like everything is disrupted. Mm, yeah, it certainly is. And hormones are a really big one. So there's a few ways that mold can affect our hormones. So number one, some of the mycotoxins that are produced are very strong xenoestrogens. So, mm. you know, the contraceptive pill, HRT, they're all synthetic estrogens. We know there are xenoestrogens in man-made products um, that are obviously very disruptive to our hormones. But one in particular is produced by the fusarium species, um, which are often found on water damaged wood. Um, and xerolinone is actually the main one that's super toxic. It's actually bad. So actually, this is a bit of a horror story. They do actually use it in agriculture to um, trigger calves, baby cows, to develop into adult heifers really quickly. Mm -hmm because it obviously promotes um, sexual development, um, but it's it's carcinogenic. It also is banned in the EU from that use. It's associated with ovarian cancer, breast cancer, miscarriage, infertility, issues with breast milk production. It's an incredibly serious chemical to be exposed to. And you think about just for a moment how common miscarriage can be. One in four is the statistic that gets bandied around. Um, how common issues producing breast milk can be, um, issues with fertility. Now, of course, there are lots of other factors that play into those things, environmental, nutritional, and otherwise. But this is like an invisible one that no one in the IVF clinics being asked about, no one in the fertility space is asking about. Um, and, you know, people often think about things like cancer, for example, as just bad luck or bad genes. And it truly isn't. It truly, it, the genetic component of cancer is less than 1%. 
it's predominantly environmental. And I mean that in the, the, the wider sense of the word. That means stress management. That means nutrition. It means what's your sense of purpose in the world. You know, how well do you sleep? Like all of those things. But there are, if you've got microbes in your home, manufacturing cancer-causing chemicals, and you continue to live in that and absorb them through the skin and breathe them in and ingest them, the outcome is only going to go one way. So, so there's a direct influence on with that particular type of microtoxin. But second of all, the stress that being poisoned causes in the body jams up detoxification processes, including the liver, um, when we see, because it's a little bit like when we drink alcohol, alcohol, ethanol is a poison. Um, and I'm not sitting in my ivory tower saying I don't drink wine, love a Chardonnay, <laughs> but it is what it is. It's facts. And when we drink alcohol, the, the liver has to prioritize metabolizing ethanol over other our other metabolic byproducts that need to be eliminated because in terms of toxicity, ethanol gets, you know, pole position. When we are metabolizing things like mycotoxins, the same thing happens. Our phase one, phase two, phase three detox pathways can only, um, you know, the production line only has a certain amount of capacity and it has to prioritize the most problematic things. And so we can see issues with Eastern metabolism um, and also, you know, all of those things are affecting us. And then thirdly, it triggers the HPA axis and it basically has the same effect as psychological stress, except it's coming from a physiological place. Now, anytime the body is being is under attack, psychologically or physically, biologically, the alarm response is the same. It's a sympathetic nervous system response, which then changes a lot of different things in the body geared towards us surviving what is supposed to be a short-term threat. <laughs> and then our nervous system is meant to return to parasympathetic, which doesn't happen for a thousand reasons, but especially if it's chronically being triggered by toxins in your environment. And then one element of the stress response is the body doesn't want you to fall pregnant if the environment's dangerous because you're vulnerable already you're even more vulnerable if you have an infant or, you know, or you're pregnant. And so it actually suppresses something called gonadotrophin releasing hormone, which then reduces FSH, which then reduces follicle development in the ovary, which then reduces your progesterone production. It makes your cycles longer typically, unless you've also got high estrogen, in which case it'll be short. And that also then contributes to PMS symptoms, you know, period pain, ovulation pain. Again, there's lots of variables that can set those hormonal issues up. And it's usually not just one thing, but you might be doing all the right things with stress management. You're taking the herbs, you're taking the supplements, you're, you know, meditating, you're, you know, doing all of those things. You're um, adjusting your workouts based on your follicular phase versus your luteal phase. And it's still not shifting. There's something else going on there influencing because again, your hormones are always just a symptom of your well being. They're not the primary issue. Mm. So many factors to consider because too often women, you know, I've fallen into, into that trap just thinking, oh, I have PMS or I have some cramps or I have some, you know, internal issues just because of like my stress or my nutrition. Yeah. But again, we need to have a overall understanding that it's, yes, those factors may affect it, but it's also the environmental side of things. And I know we've been talking um, a fair bit about mold, but we also know that EMFs have a place within mm -hmm. uh, our health. And I would love for you to um, share that wisdom with our listeners as well. Yeah. So EMFs, uh, most people probably don't know what that means. So I might talk about um, what that actually stands for first and where you find them in the environment um, before diving into kind of the common mistakes that we make as humans with our devices that are kind of wrecking our health. So EMF stands for electromagnetic frequencies and they there are natural EMFs and then there are man-made EMFs. So the sun, for example, produces solar radiation. That's a form of natural EMF that our DNA has evolved to coexist with and actually is programmed by. We also have what's called the Schumann resonance or the electromagnetic field of the earth. Um, 
And that's, again, something that we thrive in response to and that um, is present in part of, I guess, the symbiotic relationship we have with nature. But then we also have man-made EMFs. And in the last 100 years, the amount of man-made EMFs that we're being exposed to has increased a quintillion fold. Now, if you were to write down a quintillion, it's the number one with 18 zeros after it. I mean, it's incomprehensible how large that number is. And it started with the invention of electricity because electricity has an electric field and then when it's being used, it generates a magnetic field. So every wire in our home will have an electric field around it. And when electricity is running through those wires, we've got a magnetic field also being produced that can actually extend out up to 1.2 metres away from the wire. And these frequencies are things that are foreign to our body and can actually cause cell damage, DNA damage and um, trigger inflammation and free radicals and things like that. Now, I know the word frequency is often associated with more esoteric conversations. So if anyone's just, that's just triggered an eye roll. Um, what I want you to think of is when we, there are electric and magnetic fields, then we have wireless um, frequencies. This is what the radio runs on. So you listen to 106.5. That's literally the frequency that they are transmitting on, um, which is different to, you know, Triple M's frequency, whatever number they have. And so this is information transmitted on wireless radiation waves that we then have to built devices to receive and translate that into music or human speech or whatever it is. This is exactly the same technology we have. We have internet on. It's a higher frequency. Um, the wavelengths have more energy, although they tend to be shorter. 5G is the fifth generation of internet. So higher energy again, shorter wavelengths again. Um, light is also an EMF. It's actually the part of the EMF spectrum that's actually visible. So all of the colors that we see are wavelengths. They have their own frequency. You can Google what is the frequency of red. It's not a woo-woo term. It's literally the electrical wavelength of each color. So you've got sort of on either side, I think people most understand UV. Everyone knows about sun safety here in Australia because we are a sunburnt country mm -hmm. and excess UVB exposure or excess sun exposure can cause skin damage. And we're definitely a country that's at risk of that. Um, and so UVB, UVA and UVC are at the upper end of the light spectrum and aren't actually visible with the naked eye, but are still part of the light spectrum. At the bottom end of the light spectrum where red sits, we then, we've then got infrared, far, medium and near infrared. And, you know, currently infrared saunas are all the rage. That's another frequency of light. It's just not visible with our eyeballs. And then moving up the energy scale, we move out of non-ionizing radiation into ionizing radiation, which people, this category of, of radiation or EMFs, people know are dangerous. So things like x-rays and nuclear radiation. So really, really high energy and can cause instant damage. But non-ionizing radiation also causes damage. It's kind of like being a frog boiled in a pot slowly over time. You don't realize the cumulative damage until it's too late. And so it, the, I guess the two forms of EMF I want to talk about in this chat that I think probably would make the most difference for women is exposure to artificial light and blue light and how that damages our hormones and circadian rhythm, but also wireless radiation because wireless devices are everywhere, wireless headphones, our cell phones, our Wi-Fi, you know, wireless speakers. Um, I've seen wireless vibrators. I've seen, um, you know, smart, all of those health devices, the smart health devices, the wearable bands and the heart monitors, if they're emitting Bluetooth, they are damaging your health in the name of recording. I got one oh, here. Is, no, but wait, is that an aura ring? Yeah, but I turn mine off during night. Perfect. Perfect. Some of them are great and I do support the aura ring because you can turn the wireless yeah. component off. Yeah. Um, so there are exceptions to this, but if you can't turn the wireless part off, then it's actually counterproductive in some ways. And basically EMFs, if you think about them like free radicals or a toxin, they're just an electrical energetic toxin. And the longer you're exposed to it or the closer you are to the source, the more damage that's going to be done. 
for the love of God, if you are someone who tucks their mobile phone into their bra or the waistband of your pants, put it in flight mode. Make sure the Bluetooth's off, the Wi-Fi's off, and it's in flight mode. Download your podcast, download the Spotify playlist so that you're not irradiating your breasts or your pelvic organs or any of your body for that matter. Do not sleep with your phone near your bed head or under your pillow. Don't charge it near you. Make it in flight mode and put it somewhere else. Um, I Every time I see someone wearing wireless headphones, it's the same as seeing someone with 20 cigarettes in their mouth. I'm like, you're just asking for brain cancer. The link between wireless radiation and glioblastoma is well established. And you're actually putting it right next to your cranium, especially if you're wearing both, because the two actually then are transmitting to each other as well as to your phone. Wow. And so you're, you're, just, you're just absolutely irradiating your head. Now we know if you use your cell phone, holding it next to your head for 10 minutes a day over the course of 10 years, you're actually, your risk of glioblastoma is increased by 200%. Now, most people natter on their phone for hours at a time. Um, And then of course, it's still transmitting when you're not using it, by the way. So if it's in your handbag under your arm or it's sitting on your desk, you're constantly being exposed. Now, those wireless headphones produce up to 17 times more radiation than the cell phone. So if we know that link between cell phones and brain tumors is what it is, already published in the literature, the the actual relationship with wireless headphones is far more horrifying. I mean, as if it could get more horrifying. Now, I think the most horrifying thing is the only time safety testing has been done on cell phones was 1996. Now, cell phones in 1996 did not have all the bells and whistles that today's do. We have now like, I think, 15 antennas in the latest iPhone for all the bits and pieces. Um, But the safety testing was done in 1996 with the first generation of cell phones, and it was done on a plastic head full of water. Absolutely irrelevant to human biology. And what we do know in the scientific investigations that are being done outside of the telecommunications industry, the cellular damage that's being done by wireless radiation is horrific. So managing our devices is a really important part of maintaining longevity, but also health over time and reducing your risk of these really sinister issues. And, you know, I've touched on some of those already. Avoid wireless headphones, stick with wired headphones um, or do voice to, voice texting, you know, use your, if you're making calls, put them on speaker or a wired headset. Don't carry it on your body unless it's in flight mode. Don't store it near your body unless it's in flight mode. You want it at least two or three meters away from you if you're going to leave it on. Um, and then, of course, don't have it in your bedroom at night. Um, and if you do, make sure it's like 10 feet away from you and in flight mode. Um, so that'd be the key things. Um, the other wireless radiation tips I've got for you is make sure your Wi-Fi is off at night. Um, in an ideal world, you'd hardwire your internet. You can also hardwire your cell phone so you don't have to be you know, um, cruising the net um, using a wireless uh, connection, but at least you know, I work from home so I can put an ethernet cable from my modem into my laptop and not have the Wi-Fi on at all. Um, It's actually really easy to do. Um, But, you know, if you are going to use Wi-Fi, just make sure it's off at night when everyone's sleeping. If you're worried you're going to forget, get a PowerPoint timer so it goes off automatically at an agreed time, say 11 p.m. and comes back on at 6 a.m. And give yourself that opportunity to sleep in a low electro pollution environment. Um, I guess the other part of that puzzle, though, is the blue light thing. Mm. Um, And this is probably a whole other conversation. We could probably have a whole other podcast on this. So I won't try and go too deep into it. But what I will say is our bodies have a biological clock that runs on light and dark. We have the main primary clock in the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, but also every single one of our cells, even our gut cells, have got light sensors and light penetrates into our body. And basically, if I was to simplify it just you know, really unscientifically, our genes do different things when light is present than when light is absent. And so the way we were designed or the way we evolved pre-industrial revolution and the invention of electricity was our body knew what functions to perform during the day and at what time of day based on the amount of UVA and UVB that we were exposed to from the sun. 
And then when the sun set and we were in the dark or we were using incandescent bulbs or oil lamps or fires, that only produces pretty much infrared, so it doesn't um, interfere with nighttime functions. And then our genes would swap over to nighttime functions, which include things like detoxification. Now, from a hormonal perspective, I think it's really important to know that you need to see UVA rise to produce adequate progesterone. So from a light perspective, PMS is heavily influenced by the fact that we're exposed to artificial light. We're often not catching UVA rise out in nature. Um, so we're missing out on the trigger for thyroid hormone production and progesterone production because we're indoors. But further to that, artificial light is predominantly the blue light frequency or wavelength, and it doesn't change throughout the day. So the sun basically signals on the hour, every hour, just about to ourselves, here's where you are in time and space. When we're inside, our body is lost. And it's like the message is it's midday, it's midday, it's midday, it's midday. That's when the sun's highest in the sky, the most amount of blue light's present. And as a result, it's not safe for us, first of all, to take a nap. So cortisol is really high to suppress melatonin, which is our sleep hormone and primary anti-cancer hormone. It's no wonder people are having sleep issues and wake feeling tired because we come home, the sun goes down, we turn the lights on and continue to tell our body it's midday, it's midday, it's midday, it's midday. And then we stare at devices, whether it's a TV, a laptop or a phone, and that's telling our body it's midday, midday. And then we switch everything off and say, surprise, it's midnight. <laughs> and it's like going from 150 kilometers an hour to zero. The body can't, the, body can't. The, the cortisol suppress melatonin. You've actually missed that window between 10 p.m. and 12 um, a.m. to get maximum melatonin for leptin docking and therefore weight and energy regulation. So blue light can literally you overweight, literally. Um, so managing blue light and managing EMFs is a key environmental strategy for well-being. And if you want a quick guide to get started with blue light, I actually did create a free PDF you can download too that outlines some of these basics um, to help reduce your exposure. It's one of the many things that helped me change my my lifestyle was disabling my wireless devices at nighttime, especially my Wi-Fi router, because for so many years I was trying to figure out why am I sleeping so poorly? Why am I waking up throughout the night? Why am I waking up fatigue and just like really like restless um, nights? And I remember many years ago with one of my um, mentors, he asked me, where do I place my Wi-Fi routers? And I said, oh, it's like on the other side of my bedroom. And he's like, I want you to start. Yeah, I had no idea. And he's like, I want you to start turning it off every night before you go to bed. So it's completely shut off. And I think that was like the first light bulb moment I had. I slept throughout the whole night, woke up the next morning feeling fine. And it just shows you just a simple change like that makes such a big significance. And I loved how we finished today's conversation about circadian rhythm as well around not just the exposure of Wi-Fi, but also artificial lighting. And this is a really big thing that I come across with many of my clients, especially shift workers, you know, who, again, like you have a job for, for that reason, you enjoy doing it, whether it's nursing, whatever the shift work is, but it's also looking like how can you manage your lifestyle around mm -hmm. it? Because as you mentioned, one of the big signs of the dysregulation is weight gain. It's mm -hmm. unhealthy habits. It's mm -hmm. issues with your respiratory or your hormones, like every, everything. So it's like looking what areas of your health can you start making a little bit better? Maybe, maybe it's like not watching TV till midnight or if you do watch TV till midnight, it's like wearing uh, blue blockers. Like I live in my blue blo blockers mm -hmm. and, you know, sometimes I light some candles, low-tox candles though. Nice. nice. Yeah, low-tox, <laughs> yeah, we, we know, we've learned it. But, again, it's just like looking at what changes can you make in your environmental areas to to benefit you and for those who are like thinking oh my god or listening thinking oh my god this is so much work this is over it's just like start small like if it if it's your wi-fi router start yes. doing that implementing ways of turning that off or, or as you said um amy on your walks if you have your phone in your bra or by your hip 
put it on um, airplane mode, like the little shifts like that make such a big difference. Mm, it really does. And just know that you don't have to change everything at once to get a result, like literally just start with one thing um, and then work from there. But what I love about this, and actually in my practice, I always start with environmental strategies because um, often when you remove these problematic influences that are destroying melatonin, you know, messing our hormones, messing our gut flora, um, you then don't have to take all these supplements and you might not even have to change much in your diet because you're actually removing those things that are triggering inflammation and cellular damage. And then you get to see what's really true for you. Um, so these are either free or low cost, like one-off investments like blue blockers or a PowerPoint timer, for example, or a thermo hygrometer to monitor the humidity at home. They just become just another habit, you know, another part of your habit stacking. Mm. Um, so, you know, if you live in a really dry, arid place, start with EMFs and, and blue light. If you live in a damper place, maybe start with managing moisture and monitoring the humidity um, and go from there. You're not going to die tomorrow if you don't <laughs> fix it all today. So it's all good. Um, human bodies are incredibly resilient. We're designed to regenerate. And every time you take away another thing that's getting in the way of your health, your body will respond in kind. Um, but yeah, I guess in conclusion, I'll just say if you're dealing with stuff that you're just having to work very hard to stay on top of, or it's not responding, that's a red flag. There's environmental influences. Um, also, if you're dealing with anything, start with the environment because, you know, one less pill, one less dietary change, I think is a win um, for us all. The less we need to do on a day-to-day -day basis to, to manage our symptoms and actually get to the root cause is a worthwhile endeavor. And, and hopefully this is, you know, if you've have noticed anything in this episode that maybe rings true for you, this will help you investigate that a bit further and ultimately improve your health. Mm, I love everything about that, Amy. Thank you so much again for joining us. And for those who have been listening, um, as Amy said, like once you get the right pieces in place around your environmental, nutrition, support, lifestyle, whatever it is, everything starts working a little bit better. So if you enjoyed today's um, podcast, please make sure that you screenshot it, tag us at the Women's Fitness Academy. And then till next time, let's uh, make more of a positive impact on our personal health journeys. Thanks, Siggy. Thanks for having me.